Dear guests, I would welcome you, everyone, in the name of the Makita Restorer. We are glad to have you here. I am Father Hamazasp, a member of the Makita Rist Congregation. This is the seat of the College Murad Rafael. Uh, the fathers bought it in 1850 thanks of two important benefactors. There were merchants from Madras, Rafael Garamian and his uh, son-in-law, uh, son Samuel Murat, and they were the benefactors of the congregation for to the education of Armenian generations, the Armenian students, uh, and uh, these students that they studied here. They had an important role for um, the resurgement of Armenian nation in the intellectual domain, in the political domain, in the social domain. But this palace appertained to the family Zenobio. It's from 17th, 18th century, and the architect is Antonio Caspari. And uh, here you see this important Hall of Mirrors uh, was uh, the Hall of uh, Ballet. And here you see these frescoes, beautiful frescoes. It's the work of uh, Louis Dorigny, important artist, with the famous, his student, uh, Giambattista Tiepolo. And here, very interesting, at the center you see, we have Aurora. <laughs> Aurora, it's the light of the morning, and welcome the Apollo God. You see at the left side, and we have the star of the morning, you see at the right side. It's uh, significant that we have today this uh, conclusion meeting here in this hall, and uh, the fathers, they hope that will be continue even in this important palace, their contribution, cultural, educational for the Armenian people, and even it will be intercultural place uh, for the events and for the culture events, and even uh, to, um, actually it's used as uh, the events, as the exhibitions, as the concerts, and uh, we'll um, hope that will be even important center for to do our contribute for not only for our Ar Armenian nation for the whole humanity. Thank you, and God bless you, everyone. My name is Nicola Stanish. I'm the CEO of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, and on behalf of Aurora, I welcome everybody to our second session, Aurora Dialogues, Health, Security, and Humanitarian Impacts of the COVID-19 Pandemic. And also on behalf of Aurora, we thank the Mechitarist Congregation for hosting us in this wonderful building and room. And now I would like to hand over to our um, moderator and um, chair of our selection committee, Lord Aradarzi. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good night's sleep, uh, and still the memories of yesterday, the amazing evening, uh, certainly were in my dreams, and uh, when I woke up into reality again. Uh, so, I, we're going to have this interesting session to talk about the impacts of the pandemic, uh, but before I do so, I think it's worth uh, firstly acknowledging uh, Julianne Lusange. Where is Julianne? Is she here yet? Two minutes. Okay, well, when she come, it would be nice if we all give her a wide clap of applause for her amazing, amazing uh, uh, contribution last night, but also the tears that came out with it, which are still palpable. But before we start, I'm going to obviously get the, our two co-founders. I'm going to start with Ruben, who's going to say a few words, and then followed by, uh, by Nubar. Ruben. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ara. Good morning, everyone. And I'm really uh, glad to welcome all of you to this unique place, which I'm sure most of you have been in Venice, but never known. This is the, one of the Armenian heritages, which uh, we're very proud at the same time. is one of the symbol of something which we need to keep uh, <clears throat> looking to how we can do, looking forward, not only uh, being proud about the past. I also want to say thank you for all of you being patient and Yesterday was a great event and great day, but also was very freezing, and I'm glad to see all of you today here with a smiling in the face, which means we are in survival. Um, and um, unfortunately, our long weekend coming to the end, and today we have a very special session, which I'm uh, very glad to <coughs> be part, despite I'm not involved in the medicine directly, but I think it's uh, what's happened with all of us during the last three years was Hurting everyone, not only uh, the people who've been involved in healthcare. Uh, you know, we met with Nubar 20 years ago. It's amazing how run, time is running quickly. And um, when we met in Harvard and talked about the future of Armenia, we talked about the important how the future of Armenia linked to the future of the world. And when we started our role of Mentor Initiative, we thought about this link again. And two years ago, when one and a half years ago, when our Moderna just became one of the core driver of the health savings of lives of millions of people, it was very symbolic because it's exactly what we thought about the Nubar about importance not only to do in humanitarian but also to make the changes in the world for uh, other dimensions and especially in Armenia. I won't say this pandemic give us, unfortunately, so many problems, not only about vaccination, which I think you will talk, will talk but also about loneliness. People feel alone. People lost the trust of the government. People lost the trust to the system. I think we had the serious issues about not only confidence about the vaccine is one of the challenges, which I think we will discuss today also, which is very important to rebuild this confidence to trust to the institutions and to, and to medicine. On the other hand, the doctors become very highly respected, and I'm very glad to see the society is changing now back to the Respect to, I hope the same will happen with teachers because without uh, high respect to teachers and doctors, you cannot build a uh, <clears throat> healthy society. But one thing I want to say from my side, I think it's a critical for all of us to understand is humanitarian values, issues of the being together and jointly solving the problem, I think is very critical for the, all, all the challenges, all the problems we're facing. And the health is one of the key. We're living longer, but also I think it's very important to be healthy. And health is not only physical health, but also mental health. And I want to say today, it was the last day, but we had a great finalist and um, we're all involved in some way. Not all, but most of you involved in the healthcare, uh, Gregoire, Paul, and I will say it's, it's, it's a critical what we are doing and it's a very good link between the humanitarian activities and health issues for the nation. Is Julian coming? Please, Julian, coming. Let's welcome Julian. <laughs> Anyway, I don't take too much long time. I think it will be a great session. There were so many fantastic uh, speakers, and I wish to moderate It's a very jo <laughs> difficult job, but I, I'm sure uh, I will handle very well, like usually. And thank you, Ara, again, being with us and doing it all together. Thank you very much, Ruben. Thank you also for your leadership in making this happen, being one of the founders. Uh, just to let you know what's happening today, the first part of our discussion is going to be about the impact of the pandemic. Uh, across the globe, and not just the health impact, we're going to talk about all impact, because that is what the business we're in, is the humanitarian impact that the pandemic has left behind. The second session, I'm delighted to say, is going to be chaired by Nubar, who is going to address mostly about what lessons learned and the building the resilience. So, Nubar, do you want to say a few words before we kick off? Good morning to everyone as well. Um, I'll say a couple of quick things, because I'll have more maybe to say a little bit later, but on the first topic uh, of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic, there's going to be a lot said. Um, you know, as Ruben said, I, you know, for these years, particularly with Aurora, I've been a happy kind of student of what humanitarianism is all about and all the, the fantastic kind of devotion of people who do this type of work. I must say all of them common over the years had said that they didn't really choose to do this. They just found themselves being able to do this and they were drawn to it. And you know, just this last 18 months, I had that exact feeling because 
I started feeling myself drawn into the humanitarian aspect of the COVID-19 crisis with, with, with choices to be made as a company for making a billion extra doses purely for the low-income countries and having to make those kinds of choices, which doesn't seem like the same type of thing, except they expose you to incredible kind of uh, difficulties and pressures, et cetera, societally. It's been a very surreal uh, uh, period, and I'm happy to comment on that when we get to that portion. Uh, I'll just say that I think there are you know, painful parallels between the topics many of the laureates deal with, which is atrocities and, and, and man's kind of man-inflicted atrocities and what we're witnessing today. I actually think that the pandemic with this many deaths globally is equivalent to uh, the type of you know, a, a crime against humanity. Just so happens that this is a virally induced crime. But I'd say, not to seem overly harsh, but much of the damage that's been done has been done by humans, not by the virus. It's been based on inaction, it's been based on incompetent action, uh, active feeding of misinformation that has confused people, who in turn have made decisions that have literally risked them. So in many ways, any more than a war or a genocide uh, has to cause people to say, well, what did you do? Uh, in this period, I think we all kind of have to ask, not only governments, but ourselves, what did you do uh, in that situation? So I think it's a very interesting parallel between the work of Aurora and how we need to respond as a society. And, and as Ruben said, I think we're living at a time where we are being forced to think about the future in a discontinuous way. I think we've been living our lives more or less kind of continuous, somewhat. I mean, I, I had the, 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 the experience of escaping a civil war with my family. That was pretty discontinuous. But, but today, I think the whole world is becoming a refugee. The way I look at it is that every single corner of the world is experiencing what being a refugee is, in the sense that you don't know what the future is, you feel threatened, you feel helpless, you need help from other people, all things that refugees feel every single day. The rest of us see it on television, sympathize with it, etc. So people here are much more expert. But just my point of view is that I think we need to think about this every bit the way we look at mass, mass casualty atrocities and, and learn from it and try to prevent it just the same way. So that would be my position. Thank you very much, Nubar. Thank you. So we also have a number of new members to the selection, uh, the Aurora Prize Selection Committee and those sitting around the table, so including the Aurora Laureate. So if you wouldn't mind very quickly, we can go through. Let me start with Delhi, which we're absolutely delighted that you've joined the selection committee. It was your first attendance to uh, Aurora. Delhi, could I get you to introduce yourself and then we'll move that way. Thank you. Uh, Delhi Olojade, I'm uh, an expired newspaper man. <laughs> I was born in Nigeria and spent more or less the last 34 years sort of anchored in New York, but uh, living uh, all over the world like a refugee. Um, and uh, I uh, spend my time between Stellenbosch and New York City. Well, I'm Bernard Kushner. I was uh, more or less involved in the humanitarian world. Sometimes I <coughs> have to say humanitarian circus, but not today. Uh, well, uh, so I started my very sad career in uh, founding Doctor Without Borders, Zen, etc. I've been three times, three times in France. Remarkable. Uh, Minister of Health, so I'm interested in what you have said. And, uh, and foreign affairs and... I look at you as friends, so we have to speak directly and sincerely. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. It's very refreshing to hear that France gives you second and a third chance. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm Shirin Ebadi, human rights activist, lawyer, and a Nobel laureate in 2003. I'm from Iran. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mirza Dinay. I'm the 2019 uh, laureate of Aurora Prize, uh, Yazidi human rights activist and head of uh, a humanitarian organization called Airbridge Iraq, German-based, but working mainly in Iraq for the minorities. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, it's, I'm great, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Arman Voskershan. Uh, I'm Armenian and I spent all my life in healthcare, starting as a, as a doctor, as an anesthesiologist, then moving to the industry side and leading multinational companies in different regions of the world. Now I have my uh, consulting company providing services for public, private organizations and startup in medical devices and pharma. Thank you. Thank you. I come from the Congo Democratic Republic and I'm an activist for human rights. And I am the person who has received the Aurora Prize. I'm the Aurora Laureate in 2021. And I am so happy to be here with you today. I would also like to thank you all on behalf of all Congolese women who with joy have been sending me so many gratulation me messages. My name is Artun Aden. I'm from Somalia. Um, I was uh, uh, 2020 for uh, the winner for Aurora Prize, but I couldn't celebrate because of Corona. So I'm celebrating with my sister now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Good morning. My name is Marguerite Barankitz. <laughs> and I am uh, an Aurora laureate. At the moment, I'm a refugee in Rwanda, and I focus on refugees in Rwanda. Paul. I am Paul Farmer, and I'm often a, ref a refugee in Rwanda also. <laughs> and uh, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, an infectious disease doctor, and also I've been lucky enough to be a medical professor. Um, and uh, I've spent my life uh, uh, not just writing and thinking and teaching about epidemics, but responding to them. And I, I'm so grateful to be a part of the Aurora family. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, Paul. My name is Lemon Bowie. I'm from Liberia. I'm a peace activist, women's rights advocate. Feminist, no if, no but, no whatever. Um, 2011 Nobel Peace Prize winner, and I'm one of the selection committee member. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm uh, Paul Pullman, slowly becoming Armenian the way this is going. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to escape it, I have to say. But um, anyway, I had the fortune to. Um, help develop the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And um, at that time, I was running Unilever for 10 years as the CEO, implemented into the company, became an SDG advocate, and now spent entirely my time to drive the private sector individually and collectively to higher levels with an organization I created called Imagine. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Mary Robinson, uh, also, I think, an Armenian in the making. Yeah. <laughs> uh, former, well, first female president of Ireland and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I served in other mandates in the UN. Currently, I am chair of the Elders, a group brought together by Nelson Mandela in 2007 to further his legacy. And it's a great honor to be chair. I follow in huge footsteps Archbishop Tutu, who was 90 the other day, was our first chair, and he's now emeritus. And Kofi Annan was our second chair, and sadly, he uh, died. He actually died on the job. I was with him in Zimbabwe when he, when he uh, then got pneumonia and didn't recover. Um, and I'm also adjunct professor of climate justice in Trinity College, Dublin. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome all. Thank you. So, as you probably have seen, the title of today's session is Health Security, the Humanitarian Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic. But to be fair to the impact of COVID-19 as a whole, I'm sure you'll all agree there is more than just the health. So, I'm going to set the scene to talk about all aspects of it just to, you know, cover all the different points. And then we're going to hone in to different areas of interest here. 
I'm sure everyone in this room would agree that COVID-19 has generated a series of social, economic, and cultural effects which will have a long-term impact. In particular, the pandemic has exposed, exacerbated, and solidified existing inequalities in our societies. It has also made some individuals and groups living in particular places around the globe and communities even more vulnerable than they have been before. So it's not just the case of the pandemic making existing problems worse. It has also exposed areas of strength, areas of resilience, and also, not far away from me on my right, areas of creativity and innovation. There are 10 areas, I believe, long-term societal impact of COVID-19. Uh, and let me just try to go through them. The evidence of the impact points points strongly to the factors that preceded and outlast the pandemic. This is something we forget. We had a major structural problems well before the pandemic started. And this is to be expected, and we've also seen that pattern followed not just pandemics, by the way, major crises throughout the history, which have exhi exhibited that pandemics are as much societal and economic problems as they are medical or healthcare problems. Now, the first is the increased importance of local communities. One of the things we've all witnessed during the pandemic, that local communities have become more important than ever. And this is an important point to uh, remember. And during the pandemic, local and hyper-local charitable and voluntary organizations have been the crucial to the response of the COVID-19. And also, they are the inequalities between the communities, and these equalities between the communities based on the strengths of the community infrastructures. So everything shifted local, but we've seen inequalities between those at a local level providing support. The second point to highlight is low and unstable levels of trust in governance. Following a brief initial increase, the trust in many governments and feelings of national unity are in decline, and we know that. Wherever you happen to live, in the West, the East, uh, developed world, lower income, uh, lower and middle income world, trust in local governments and feelings of local unity have been higher and steadier. And declining trust is a major challenge that needs to be addressed because it undermines the ability to mobilize the public behavior for a wider social and health benefits. And that's a serious challenge to most of our political leaders at the moment, whichever government you speak to. The third is the widening geographical inequalities. And what I mean by that, geographic and spatial inequalities that have widened. Health and well-being, local economic risk and resilience, poverty and deprivation, and response planning all have an important place, dimension, important place dimensions that has shaped the impact of the crises. And we've seen that across the globe. The fourth one has been the exacerbation of the structural inequalities of COVID-19 and the government's response to it have impacted different people in different ways, often amplifying existing structural inequalities in lower income and poverty stricken societies, and also impacted mostly the socioeconomic inequalities in education and skills, and the integrational inequalities with a particular effect on children, including vulnerable children across the globe. Families with children and young people. There are differential effects within these along the dimensions of gender, race, ethnicity, and social deprivation, which we have been both exposed and exacerbated. The fifth one is the worsened health outcomes and growing health inequalities. Like structural inequalities, 
health outcomes for COVID-19 have followed a pattern of existing health inequalities. There are ongoing health impacts from long COVID as well as from delays in care seeking and reprioritization of resources. In the UK, for example, we have 5.5 million people waiting for elective surgery as we speak. The sixth is a greater awareness of the importance of mental health, we touched on in the committee yesterday. The pandemic and various measures taken to address it have resulted in differential mental health outcomes. Access to support for new cases for those with pre-existing mental health conditions has also been disrupted. In addition, to services for children and young people. I mean, there's a classic 12 to 16 year olds, which you speak to any head school teacher will tell you, the burden of mental health in that age group has been absolutely dramatic. And the sad fact is most health systems are not equipped to deal with that major burden. The seventh is the pressure on revenue streams across the economy. There are likely to be additional pressures on government spending in the medium to long term as a result of increasing levels of debt and possible falling tax revenues due to risk around unemployment, failing businesses, decreased consumption, and significant shifts in the structure of the economy. And we know the correlation between poverty and health. We know the correlation between poverty and education. And we know the correlation between uh, poverty and societal stability. The eighth is the rising unemployment and changing of the labor markets. Employment and household income levels have fallen and will likely to worsen for the foreseeable future. This will lead to an increased dependency on social security, which the current system may be ill-equipped to deal with it effectively. This will matter not only for those who are or will become dependent on the state social security support, but also because it may require significant adjustments to the social security system in order for it to keep pace with the demand. In other words, the big question, is our social security systems post-COVID fit for purpose? Nine the renewed awareness of education and skills. I think the consequences of COVID, I hope you agree with, of lost access to education at all levels, globally, coupled with the changes to assessments, exams, will, felt, will be felt for many years to come. And wholly recovering lost education, I believe, is unfeasible. This has been exacerbated with existing socioeconomic inequalities that I mentioned earlier, and also highlighting the digital inequalities that we're going to be seeing in the globe from here on. So that's my opening statement. Uh, very much hope that will guide us to, throughout the discussion today, or at least as a resource, I hope, for policymakers and civil societies, media and others, who are trying to make sense of this changing landscape uh, post-COVID-19. So, on that note, I would like now to move on to contributions from this very distinguished panel. May I also say, this discussion is not going to be confined to the panel. Anyone who has a, you know, a strong desire to ask a question, please put your hands up. This is about inclusive and everyone in this room who may wishes to make a comment or ask a question. I'm going to move on now to more targeted questions than what, we, uh, what, what we've said earlier in terms of the opening remarks of Ruben, uh, Nubar, and just myself. And I'm going to ask Paul to talk a little bit about health, vaccines, really focus on the health systems as a whole, and not just in the developed world with your amazing experience working in lower and middle-income countries. Uh, what do you think the challenges are? And if you have any insight or steers, what the solutions might be, Paul? 
Well, you know, one of the reassuring things, I, well, look, first of all, thank you so much, Ara, for that masterful uh, list of challenges. And it sounded a little bit gloom and doom in a way, uh, but on, on the bright side, you know, as COVID is unfurled, it's, it's reminded us that, uh, as you said, and as Nubar said, these are really often human-made problems. Um, and given that since uh, for many decades now, uh, people involved in humanitarian responses have also seen the inadequacy of any approach that doesn't strengthen health systems, since this clamor has been going on now for decades, uh, we finally have a moment, perhaps, when uh, large fractions of the population understand that we have to invest in health systems. But that's really the, the, the primary bright spot. We can look and find places like Rwanda, where you've seen a national health system rolled out rather effectively after some terrible disruption. You can find examples of where decreased investments have led to very poor performance. But now we have before us a chance to have an agreement on the basic need for universal health care. Uh, and that's going to require uh, significant investments in health systems. And I, I also believe we, we're facing, to add to your list, um, a crisis uh, in terms of how we educate people who will be part of those safety nets and health systems. And that we're, need to, we're going to need to invest more in universities and in improving the quality of the delivery of our services uh, in general. So uh, on the one hand, as you put laid it out, uh, a rather uh, not a dreary prospect, but a, a looming uh, challenge, and on the other, uh, increased public awareness of the need to act swiftly. So I, I'm going to be leaving here an optimist or remaining an optimist. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, and rightly so, uh, because the only way out of this is a degree of optimism, and the next one is innovation, which we'll cover later. So uh, thank you for that. So could I move on to you, Mary, and that is the, you know, the gender role, certainly women, <clears throat> uh, and the impact it's had. I mean, you know, I remember during the lockdown period, many of very distinguished and many female colleagues that I had who had to give up their jobs to care for their kids who mm. were leaving school and uh, the gender abuse that mm. was going on. <clears throat> and I wonder, being a champion of that cause, uh, what solutions you have there? Well, thank you. I also wanted to commend you on um, those excellent 10 points that framed our discussion. And you brought out uh, the inequalities from the beginning, that uh, the problem with COVID-19 is that ex it exacerbates all of the inner inequalities and brings out the intersectionality between them, a good feminist term, as my friend Lima would, would, would recognize. Um, and, and this is so true. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're in an abusive household, COVID was a nightmare because you had to live with this abusive partner. Um, if, if you were a child in an abusive household, uh, think of what that was like. Um, uh, education. Um, the girl child deprived of education in many parts of the world is pushed into early child marriage. Um, the elders have highlighted early child marriage as a harmful traditional practice. We helped to form the big network, Girls Not Brides. And we were moving forward. We got into the Sustainable Development Goals. You know, um, it really was showing progress. It has been absolutely devastated. And, uh, you know, so that's part of this intersectionality. Um, if you're black, it's much worse. If you're black and have a disability, if you're black with mental health problems, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, yes, the unfair care burden, um, the way in which um, this is not uh, handled in society anyway, in a fair way, and then COVID exacerbated that. And many women, as you said, had to leave um, their jobs. Um, uh, there, are, there are, you know, figures. There's actually a lot of um, articles and research 
on gender and inequality in COVID, which is, which is very helpful. I just looked at a couple of the things that give some figures. For example, women's jobs represent 39% of the global economy, but 54% of the overall job losses. That's a report from McKinsey um, in July. And they have the increased burden of unpaid uh, caregiving, etc. And um, at the same time, an awful lot of the essential frontline workers have been women who have carried the burden of helping us during COVID. Um, the doctors, the nurses, but also the cleaners, and then the essential services in essential uh, food stores, etc. Um, so many of them have been women, and many of them also, as frontline uh, workers, uh, were deeply affected. Um, I like the way UN women uh, uh, you know, make the point in, in a recent report that without gender responsive policies, the pandemic risks derailing uh, hard-won gains and is already uh, derailing. And they put emphasis in particular on sexual and reproductive health and also uh, the need for um, more and better uh, uh, data. Um, they then, I think, I, I really like the way they sum up um, uh, what we need now um, urgently and part of it is something that you uh, referred to, the importance of universal gender responsive social protection systems. And that we don't have and that we really need. Um, expanded access to affordable quality childcare services. Again, you know, so important if women are to have equality. Uh, the reversal of long-standing inequalities, including unequal division of work in the home, the gender pay gap, and pervasive undervaluing of the work done by women, particularly the unpaid care work, obviously. But, and, and the other thing is women are not in the decision-making about COVID, and that, that's really quite a problem. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I wear this badge quite a bit, and so does um, Paul most of the time, but I don't see it on you at the moment. Oh, well, went to the dry cleaner, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 53 of the 251 Sustainable Development Goal indicators uh, make direct reference to gender equality, um, uh, women and girls. But women aren't at the seat of the working groups on um, implementing, and particularly aren't on working groups implementing program um, uh, COVID policies. So that also, you know, the lack of a seat at the table is also uh, part of the problem of inequality. And if I may say so, because I just want to finish on this, I don't want to go on too long, but I wanted to pick up on uh, COVID, because often when I speak about COVID, it's in the context of helping us uh, with lessons for the climate crisis. Can I just give you four quick lessons? Okay. Um, uh, COVID, I think, has taught us, first of all, that collective human behavior can actually matter, because it's the only thing that's been protecting us from the COVID before we got the vaccines, and we have inequitable um, access to vaccines, as, we, as we've said. So um, uh, collective behavior is going to be necessary going forward. We must change very dramatically our consumption, our production, and the developed world must lead on changing behavior. Secondly, government matters. Uh, you talked about the trust, but actually it's very visible, um, the governments that coped well and the governments that coped badly. And in that point, women-led governments Jacinda Ardern is the poster child, but women-led governments actually did do better overall. You know, um, Angela Merkel in Germany, the, the Prime Minister, uh, um, the Prime Minister Bermuda, to go to another area. You know, they, they, they took it seriously. They listened to the science, etc. And that's the third point: um, the importance of science. Um, uh, every government has listened to its health experts, and if it hasn't, then um, they've had terrible deaths and excessive um, health problems. Um, in going forward, we must listen to climate scientists as we've listened to health experts. And the last point, but it's an important one, and it touches on Aurora, I think, compassion matters. What has been remarkable is the compassion in countries, the compassion of food parcels, the compassion of caring, the compassion of being aware of it being much harder on somebody else. Um, the empathy that comes from that and there has been a shortage of solidarity and empathy in our world. And it came out with COVID very strongly. It didn't come out enough on equitable access to vaccines. But internally in countries, in every country, it has been notable. And I think that's positive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you.
you, you said some very, very powerful words. And I think, interesting about women leaders in countries that did better, you, you are spot on. It's interesting also the narrative was very different. So, you know, in the UK, the narrative was, we the polit political narrative, we follow the science. Actual fact, if you see New Zealand said, we look at the science and we make the decisions. Uh, a very different narrative. Uh, just to finish off, just to highlight the importance, and this is to many of the male co colleagues here, I'll be very interested, Bernard, at some stages, how do you get politicians to, to act on these things? Demos said that nearly 243 million women and girls between the age of 15 to 49 experienced violence by an inmate partner, intimate martyr last year and intensified over the last year. 243 million. That's an amazing number. Uh, and you can't hide that. I mean, as you said, COVID, this existed before, but COVID exposed it, amplified it. Uh, let's turn to another woman champion. Lima, I'd be great to get your thoughts on, obviously, something very close to your heart, poverty and nutrition, again, it did exist before the pandemic, but it's been significantly amplified. Any thoughts on that? Thank you. Uh, uh, during the pandemic, I was stuck in Ghana. And I remember when the max mandate became prevalent. I asked this driver, why are you not wearing a max? And he said to me, Madam, the max is a dollar. If I have to weigh between buying a max and buying bread for my children, I'll choose to buy the bread because I don't know this disease and I don't know if I'm ever going to catch it, but I know hunger and my children knows hunger. That really got me thinking Thinking about the way we've conducted our world, technology, wealth, you name it, more than ever before, we are, there are phones that when you walk in the room, apps that they will show Nuba's face and his contact or whatever will come. I saw it with someone. And I realized that in the midst of all of these, what we miss in our world is to focus on people. Everything that we've done from technology to this to that to the other was for the greater good of people. But somehow, we've managed to take people out of the equation and it's all about what, how the world can look good. Ruben made a point about we are all becoming refugees. And if we really want to chew on that to say that we're all becoming refugees, we have to also understand that the, the, what comes with being a refugee, hunger, poverty, and all of the different things. I think it's time for us to reimagine if really we're becoming refugees, what peace is. And most times people think that peace is just the absence of war. But I believe that peace is the presence of conditions that dignifies everyone. And those conditions include how everyone have poor talks about our basic health care, investing in all of these things. And I think it's time for us to really think how we can do our world in a way that it impacts the, the, the little things that people, that matters to people. Ara, you give a list, and on your list you talk about local communities. I was really very happy when you put local communities because the reason why local communities have been effective and efficient in this COVID fight is because their focus has been on people. In our community, we decided to distribute food. And we listed 50 families from one poor community. When we took food into that community, 100 families showed up. We didn't have food for 100 families. We had food for 50 families. The 50 families that showed up decided we will share with the other 50 that came. And this is what why communities have become, local communities have become heroes in this fight around COVID. Three things I want us to remember as a lesson learned. 
During the Ebola pandemic, it was the local community that helped to calm it in all of the countries that had Ebola. At the end, no one looked back again. So today, if there's any lesson we've learned, now that we've seen that local community have what it takes to help, let's elevate their roles. Let's engage them continuously, not when there is another problem, then we start to look back and say, where are the people? And let's empower them. I think if we use these three E's, elevating the roles of local community, engaging them and empowering them, because when the food comes, the politicians will probably take it and use it to make themselves look good. But all of these, whether it's poverty, whether it's nutrition, and again, women and children suffer the most, continue to suffer in this um, COVID pandemic. But my belief in local people and their focus on people is what is making this fight easy for many communities. And I think this is where the investments should go. Julianne never left DRC. I was on the ground. Other people, Marguerite was doing her work. People, let's bring people back in the center of all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Always passionate, amazing. It comes from the heart, and uh, thank you for that. And local communities is the answer. Shireen, I'm just going to come to you now. Uh, are the predictions in some places, very reliable sources, is suggesting that 20 million girls will never return to school uh, in terms of education? That is a catastrophic forecast. And I just wonder what your thoughts are in addressing that issue, which is another inequalities issue. Spread of coronavirus, COVID-19, resulted in a number of people having to forcefully drop out of their education. And the gap between the poor and the rich uh, widened even more than before. Now, allow me to start off by taking a look at uh, the region from which I come from, which is the Middle East. In my country, Iran, Like many other countries in Asia, we had a very weak infrastructure and also very weak structure for online courses. And uh, as the Ministry of Education in Iran said, there were some three million students and pupils in Iran that could not continue their education uh, during a COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, and this is official figures I'm mentioning, but in reality, as we have heard from the uh, teachers union in Iran, is twice as that. And why is it that because of the pandemic, they couldn't continue with their education? First, as I told you, it was access to uh, the online education was very poor. It was poor even before the pandemic, let alone after the pandemic. And I should mention that even some of our teachers didn't even know how to use internet. And why is that? Because they had no access to internet. Unfortunately, in Iran, we don't have internet access everywhere around the country. And those who have access to internet have to have money in order to be connected to internet. It is not a free service. And uh, it's not only that, those who have access to internet, the speed is very, very slow. And now imagine in remote areas of Iran, how do they cope? They have no internet, they have no access 
to the digital world. So it's very natural that uh, students and teachers really suffered as a result and couldn't do anything. The whole world suddenly uh, started using internet, online education became rife, but sadly not in Iran. In addition to that, smartphones were very, very expensive in Iran. They continue to be very expensive in Iran. and. And bear in mind that Iran is facing economic sanctions because of its nuclear program, and as a result of which, even uh, those who have access to smartphone have to pay at least twice as much for one. So as a result, Many were left out of the cycle of education. In addition, because the situation of uh, those who lived in poverty and the vulnerable section exacerbated because of the pandemic, uh, many in poorer families sent their young kids to work in order to eke out a living. Leima mentioned earlier that uh, how expensive it is to even buy a mask. Now, can you imagine in a poverty-stricken remote part of the country, how do you expect the head of the family who was earning a living by having a very small business suddenly is out of work, so how else can he feed his family but send his children to work in order to eke out a living? So as a result, they could not continue their education. So lack of access to online education and then poverty. In addition, Many young girls were forced into very early marriage because their fathers could not feed them anymore. And unfortunately, if you don't know, the legal age for marriage in Iran is, is 13 for girls. Even worse, the, the government was encouraging these families to make sure the daughters get married at an early age. And to that end, they would offer loans for in, to any family who would um, find a husband for their daughters at an early age. So they'd be entitled to an interest-free interest loan. And uh, under the pretext that it would uh, make your life easier as well. Now, what did we do as activists, as NGOs? What did we do? But first, I, I'd like to mention that uh, because as I'm sure you're all aware that uh, I have been working outside Iran. I'm in self-imposed exile because I am against the government. And in Iran, uh, I used to work with a um, group of uh, teachers who worked in rural areas, and I've continued my work with them, albeit from outside Iran. So I am trying to provide them with financial help, with moral support in order to continue their work without access to internet, without access to smartphones. 
So all we can do as NGOs is try and mobilize these teachers to make the effort to go to these rural areas um, well, and uh, give face-to-face -face teaching to children. And what makes it worse, again, is that many of these children in uh, remote areas, not only in Iran, but also in um, places like um, Bangladesh, where they don't even have an identity papers, like in Rohingyas in Bangladesh, going moving away from Iran. They don't even know these children don't even have any identity. And if they don't have IDs, how can they even attend school? Now, going back to Iran, this, this situation, the same situation exists in Iran. We have many children who, many of whom live on the eastern borders of Iran. We border Afghanistan and Pakistan on the east. And these are children of uh, Afghan or Pakistani men married to Iranian women. And as a result, they, were, they do not have any ID papers because the Iranian government does not give them birth certificates because they do not recognize the foreign husbands of the Iranian women. So I have tried my best to coordinate with Iranian lawyers in Iran to facilitate the education of these children. Now, I am going to say a few words about Afghanistan. I'm sure you're aware of the crisis in Afghanistan at present. What is happening in Afghanistan is even worse than in Iran. They're even poorer. And not only that, they have, uh, as you all know, the Taliban have taken over the country. Girls in Afghanistan, as you may be aware, can only, if they're lucky, attend uh, primary school. They're not allowed to go to high school. However, I myself, with the help of several Afghan ladies, we launched a campaign thanks to which only in one province we have managed to gain access for girls to attend high school. But that is only in one province in Afghanistan. So we're trying to encourage the Taliban to use that as an example uh, and to, to say to the Taliban that, look, if you could try and uh, acquire international aid, if you do likewise and if you help us um, promote this education of girls in, and provide their access to high school. So we're trying to convince the Taliban that it is good for the reputation to do so. Um, I just wanted to finish. <laughs> I just wanted to finish by saying that we women, both in Iran and in the Middle East at large, we have many problems, as you are well aware. We fight on a daily basis for freedom and democracy and many uh, uh, comforts that you have in Europe, we lack in our part of the world. However, as the saying goes, whatever does not kill you will make you stronger. And we have become stronger, and I promise you that freedom and democracy in our region will happen, will be realized thanks to women and our women will prove. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Shireen, the, the way you speak, the passion you bring into this, and pardon me for interrupting you, one of the way in which you judge your moderator is to ensure that they don't compromise your nutritional needs in about an hour. So uh, apologies for doing that. And again, very insightful. As you were speaking, I was thinking potentially we can actually capture a lot of these thoughts and maybe write up something on behalf of Aurora. This is a very uh, touching and evidence-based in every way possible. So I'm going to move on to next questions. I'd be really appreciate if we can keep them into short answers, if that's okay. I'm going to move on to Delay. Now, journalism, uh, when I meet a journalist, Delay, I'll walk away, uh, I'll keep miles away here, because uh, uh, by experience. So I just want to, what's your thoughts? How did journalism do as a profession during the pandemic? So the, the, the backdrop to that is that uh, we innovated our way out of quality by, by we, I meant in the, in the broadest sense of these te technology platforms having already destroyed uh, sort of the gatekeeping function yes. that uh, and made obsolete people like me and uh, and David Ignatius, uh, and, and this uh, destruction of the gatekeeping function in journalism came home to roost when the pandemic hit, because it is a good thing that new technology and all these social media platforms have given voice to nearly everyone on earth, but there are consequences to that, and some of it is by design. It is now a reality, I think, that Facts and fiction have equal billing, if not the other way around, uh, that uh, truth and falsehood are now at minimum at par. So the gatekeeping function that traditionally tried to establish what the facts are via generally trusted institutions uh, that has collapsed. And a lot of local media, especially you know, communities around the world, are no longer financially sustainable. The only ones surviving now are a handful of the biggest ones, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Le Monde, you know. Uh, but, but at the local level, is complete devastation. So what this has done is that when the pandemic hit, there was no one guiding the public conversation in any way because everybody now had equal access. We've achieved perfect equality which meant that lots of rumors and falsehoods were just crossing through the system. So it's becoming increasingly hard to uh, expose the public predominantly to factual information. And this is by design, because it's a good thing to give voice to everyone, lift every voice and sing, it's a beautiful song. It's a good thing to do that, but by design, a lot of these platforms have made it uh, 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 possible to amplify first the worst and most inaccurate rumors and falsehoods because that promotes more engagement. So if you ever belong to a WhatsApp group, you know how difficult it is to exit because it announces to everyone that you've left the building. So in real life, you can sort of sneak out behind and uh, go quietly away if you are no longer interested in what we are saying here. But on the platforms, you, you are constrained from doing that. So they did this deliberately. Now, is there a way for us to get out of that? Is by slowly building the capacity of verifiable media again to mediate public conversations and not just have uh, a free-for-all disaster such as we have had uh, at the moment. And this is not self-serving in any way because, you know, I'm 60 years old, I'll soon die off. Uh, it's not for me, but for the younger people in the room, uh, you face a really bleak future if there is no distinguishing characteristic between truth and falsehood. And so I think the pandemic has shown us how we could be utterly self-destructive yeah. when we remove yeah. this um, uh, basic gatekeeping function uh, when we all come into the public square to have a conversation. 
Thank you, Dale. I think that's brilliant. Could I also add the, 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 the falsehood to legitimize it created an industry of doctors and scientists who we've never heard of before coming in front of the television or the radio and saying some stuff which, actual fact, you will lose your license saying them. It's astonishing, yeah, really, it's truly. It's like is. equating yeah. my views about vaccine and the science of vaccines yeah. with the uh, Nubers. Yes. I mean, I may have some interesting things to say, but it's not of equal weight. Yes. Because he's an expert and I am not. Yes. The same way that I probably know journalism more than you, yeah. right? Yeah. So we have to find a way of ascribing quality to certain voices above others. This is it's just the reality that some people are experts at some things and others are not. And yes. we should give credence to this. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. So let's move on to uh, Mirza, your, an Aurora Laureate. Uh, Nubar, Ruben, and I had the privilege of being invited to Rome before we came here on a multi-faith uh, organization hosted by His Holiness the Pope. And the striking thing which we picked up, the three of us, is which we weren't aware of for that, is the number of conflicts around the world have significantly increased during the pandemic. In other words, the pandemic was providing some form of a cover. As you have worked with uh, refugees and, uh, and conflicts, are just any, any reflection on, on that statement? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, let's say, uh, first, we know that uh, there are certain communities who are directly, also without pandemic, are affected very hard by conflict. And, uh, and one of the results is refugee or leaving the country or displaced from their own areas. So after pandemic, uh, the challenge became uh, thousands time more than before because uh, first, the restrictions of movement from countries to country. We know that uh, movement uh, is either in in regular way or irregular way through smuggler groups. And but after the rest restrictions, we saw that those people who whom life is in risk were uh, also uh, in a very difficult situation that they couldn't uh, move, so their life remained in refugees. And also the restriction within the refugee camps. You, you can imagine that um, you should avoid the contact with other people, but uh, those people are living in a tent with a four by four meter, and he's far away from the next family with three meters. So, And you have a collective of people that can be a uh, uh, ground of a big pandemic in that area if you have a ref refugee camp within one square kilometer with 25,000 people. So this was a big challenge for, and is still a big challenge for the people who are living in that, uh, in that places. I think uh, the most important that the uh, international community failed and, and the countries going back to selfishness uh, stronger than before, unfortunately, this this kind of localism, and therefore platforms like Aurora is, are very important to spread the the and, to, and share the human values that we are together have. We should work more on that, and also in the international community, especially the those leading powers in the we actually. So I would use this platform to to appeal to them just respect your signature about the human declaration, uh, uh, about the right to life, the right to education. Just you have to respect your signature about all these conventions that you had signed for the human rights in order to bring the life to normal situation. Thank you, thank you. I mean, do you, do you think the media has a role here in, in exposing these atrocities across during the pandemic because the main line headline news is always COVID. That's the, it, it, it didn't get the air time. Yeah, this is, it, this it is also a, a big problem. I think today just Delhi said that we have now a parallel media that has an impact sometimes more than a sufficient media. We, yeah. we say how uh, fake news in the in the in the in the social platforms, social media, uh, are affecting the communities. And definitely, we have to work on that to bring that positive spread to the to the communities over all the world. 
in order in state to bring only negative news to the world. I think we need to work on that uh, collectively, not only uh, separately. Thank you. Thank you, Mirza. So we're going to move on to Marguerite. You're going to speak in French. I understand, Marguerite. Thank you. No problem. Let me just go through. I mean, one of the, the thing that hit us all in the face, and I remember I volunteered to work in the intensive care unit as a doctor, ended up being the porter, turning patients around for about three weeks. The striking thing is that 90% of the beds were occupied by people of ethnic minorities, black and ethnic minorities. This is in London, one of our teaching hospitals. So I just wonder your thoughts about ethnicity and the inequalities during the pandemic and what lessons we can learn from that. Thank you very much. So thank you, Mirza, for highlighting inequalities. I mean, when you are a refugee, you're very vulnerable. And the pandemic has actually proven that United Nations agencies and nations in general are weak, first of all, in terms of forecasting the pandemic. I shall explain myself better. When the pandemic took over, we entered a locked down period, a period of confinement. I mean, refugees survive on little daily chores uh, through which they manage to get some food. I mean, there are two types of refugees, the ones in the cities and the ones in the camps, in the refugee camps. And in the case of a lockdown, all UN bodies have to comply with the rules emanated in New York. And the number one rule is protect yourself. So this means that you cannot have contact with these individuals. Conversely, NGOs such as Doctors Without Borders, the Red Cross, have a different way to react to that. But if you think of a refugee camp, I mean, very often in the camp, there is a very high number of individuals, 68,000 individuals, 29,000 children, and the schools are closed down. So this is complete chaos. UNHCR communicates that there is not enough food. Food supplies are not arriving. And nobody was ready for this. I mean, how can the people in the camps survive if they can't get out because of confinement? I mean, compassion and empathy are the values. It is necessary to work with your heart, not according to the system. This means that these agencies and organizations need to be renewed. They need a new organization. And we have to think about how to structure our humanitarian agencies, because they work within a system that lacks humanity. You know, uh, sometimes it is forbidden to provide services, so they do not provide services. But this is a very serious situation. In the countries of the region, and I'm talking of refugees in Burundi and Congo, I mean, those countries have taken advantage of the political opportunity related to this weakness. So the, the countries actually opted for a quick re-entry the refugees in their countries to demonstrate that the countries were in peace. And this was just pushing and pulling the life of these individuals everywhere, you know. Um, the UN services could not go into the camp because of their own rules. The countries in the region 
exclaimed, we are accused of keeping you here while there is peace in your country. Tanzania has brought more than 60,000 refugees in Burundi. And in Burundi, there's no protection whatsoever. The people who have come back have died. Many had to hide. There were no longer journalists able to denounce this crime against humanity. And we ended up being responsible for everything. But as I told you, love has made us ingenious. I mean, I asked all my friends to help me. So we started farming land because you could go out to farm land. So we started producing food. We set up communities. But of course, the main message is we need to review the United Nations system because when something like this happened, and I can see Mr. Kushner here with us, so you are here with us. I can see Mary Robinson. So I'm appealing to you, and this is a cry of the mother. I mean, I had 68,000 people, 29,000 of which were children, and they were all saying, sorry, we can't do anything. Everybody was afraid, but there are people sitting in this room who said, no, we are going to help you. And this is how we managed to buy food and to survive and maintain our dignity, albeit this suffering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. That was very, very passionate. And, uh, and I'm sure when we come with Bernard, who is going to deal with all uh, international corporations, see, love to see what he has to say about this. We're moving to Paul, uh, Paulman, on this occasion. Uh, Paul, you have made a significant contributions to the uh, SDGs. And, you know, the COVID has had a huge impact on the progression. I just thought, where are you in terms of catching up uh, on this vital uh, agenda uh, around the world? We've heard a lot about the uh, local activities on the ground and, and how important it is. But at the same time, we need to be sure that uh, global governance works. And uh, we, uh, we need to pull together in a lot of respects uh, from the top as well as from the bottom and, and as has been mentioned before that's that's probably where a bigger failing has showed up in the cracks of COVID than we imagined. You know people say COVID was the biggest crisis but we've had uh, Ebola, SARS, Zika, Asian flu. The cirrhotic diseases have come at us for every two, three, four, five years and they actually will accelerate with the uh, continued destruction of biodiversity at a level we've never seen and climate change uh, haunting us and, and driving again the, the poorest into poverty. So the surprise actually should not have been COVID. The surprise should have been our inability to react and rise to the challenge at a global level. And this has surprised a lot of people. I used to chair the International Chamber of Commerce with 48 million companies uh, until last year. And we saw about uh, 90 countries put protective measures in place so that the PPE material and other things would not be able to be exported from one country to another. We've seen on the vaccine a disastrous statistic that the emerging markets only have about 3% of the vaccines, whilst more than 60% has been given to the developed market, so first and second class citizens. And, um, and we've actually seen, as was mentioned before, that according to the studies we do as the UN, about 70 countries in the world, democracy has go gone to uh, the different direction than we uh, aspire to. So, so this is where a challenge is, and these institutions that we have designed, most of them from the 1944 period, they're not really anymore designed for this global interdependence that we have. So issues like the financial market, cyber security, uh, the pandemic and climate change really are not moving forward at the speed. And, and unfortunately, we've now discovered with COVID that we don't have that much time. 
I think COVID has done a good thing in terms of turning points because we've realized that uh, we can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. And for the first time, people are seeing these broader relationships between um, biodiversity, uh, human health, uh, climate change, with the tragic death of George Floyd, the uh, racial inequalities. So people are starting to see a little bit what we were trying to do with the SDGs, the famous uh, 17 goals, 169 targets, this enormous uh, interdependence. And uh, unfortunately, on the SDGs itself, we, we reckon we weren't on track in the first place. You know, gender equality before COVID was taking 257 years still. Uh, climate change was on a trajectory that was absolutely out of control. And it hasn't really gotten much better. I think COVID at the end of the day has pulled us back about uh, 15 to 20 years on the agenda. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that we cannot achieve it. You know, the sustainable development goals indeed have people at the center with a very simple goal to irreversibly eradicate poverty and do that in a more sustainable and equitable way. And despite COVID, every study that we run, every um, uh, angle we look at it, it is by all means feasible to get to these targets if we rise collectively to that challenge. And the interesting thing, what COVID has also shown is that we are at the point now where the cost of inaction is actually becoming higher than the cost of action. A very sad point to be at, but actually a fairly good point because our economic system only moves if people see these enormous opportunities to address it. We've spent on COVID just in Europe and the US about $17 trillion to save lives and livelihoods. And we've seen, according to the IMF, the global economy lose the equivalent of about $26, $27 trillion. So take these numbers for a second and compare that with the three to $5 trillion that is needed every year to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And I would argue now that we are at a point which is ludicrous to call ourselves the, the most intelligent species now that I think about it, because we're actually at a point that for each of the goals that we have, each of the 17 goals, we're incurring more cost than it would take to implement all of the goals. On conflicts and wars, we're spending 8 to 10% of global GDP right now. Holding women back, goal number five, cost you $25 trillion on the economy. The pandemic that I just mentioned. You know, climate change, the IMF just came out with a number of $5.9 trillion that it cost us right now. So this is bizarre what is happening. So what is important is that we get these efforts on the ground, but also at the same time that we get the global structures to work uh, properly. So we've talked about some of these advantages and disadvantages of COVID, but I think on the SDGs and coming specifically to your question, the, um, the main items that we need to stay focused on is without any doubt uh, climate change and inequality. They're both obviously very closely related as COVID has shown. The, the poorest, again, paid a disproportionate price. Uh, on climate change, by the way, we need a 45% reduction between now and 2030. We're on a trajectory with the 113 countries that have submitted their plans to a 16% increase. The major countries haven't even commit, uh, committed their plans yet. So the COP26, that many of us will be there, is absolutely important to get the countries to not only make these higher commitments, but to do that for between now and 2030, what are the specifics that they're going to do. And one of these things that has to come out there is to show this global solidarity in terms of the funding made available for emerging markets, in terms of adaptation resilience, in terms of the 100 billion for the climate fund, in terms of vaccine availability. Because if we don't do that, we just lose our trust in terms of being citizens of the world. So uh, the COP is, is, so the climate change one is the first agenda. The second one is inequality. 150 million people more pushed back into poverty because of COVID. 1.7 billion vulnerable people, still 4.5 4 billion people living on less than $5 a day. So what is the agenda to get back and what are we focused on? Uh, and I'll only do on the top lines. The first one is uh, COVID. We need to get to the WHO targets, 40% by the end of this year, 60% uh, mid next year in terms of global vaccinations. And, and I think a lot of great people are working these things. And, and uh, this will stay with us, so we need to get that under control. Not giving vaccines with the uh, International Chamber of Commerce, we estimate the cost to the global economy could be up to $9 trillion in mutations, in 
cut off supply chains and other things. So this is the 50 billion more that we need is a very, very small investment for what we have spent. The second thing that we need to do um, is to ensure that financing is available. We have spent all the money in the uh, developed markets, but hardly anything in the emerging markets. They don't have access to financing. Their markets have dried up. They have no uh, remittance. The uh, commodity prices have collapsed for them. There's no way that they can get out of this uh, disaster by themselves. So the uh, special drawing rights of the IMF, uh, the multilateral banks that we need to leverage up four or five times more, uh, the financial rules that need to be adjusted, the sad thing of abolishing the 0.7% or the 0.5%, which is criminal for countries like myself. So the second thing is financing. The third thing I talked about is uh, climate change. And then the fourth thing, which is very important, <clears throat> is we have to get the private sector to rise up to that challenge. Overseas development aid is 160 billion, three to five trillion for the sustainable development goals. If we don't unlock the private sector, we simply won't get there. So we're trying to work and rally these, uh, the private sector together at scale, not only to give courage to the uh, government to move, but to actively take part in the ownership of the, of the um, SDGs. I just published a book last Tuesday that is called Net Positive, how companies <coughs> thrive by giving more than they take. And the idea here is a very simple one, and then I'll stop. World Overshoot Day was uh, July 29th this year, which is the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish. So being in the CSR space, which is less bad, is simply not good enough anymore. We can't afford to be less bad. And there's nothing to celebrate by being less bad. Instead of <coughs> you know, killing 10 people, I'll only kill five, so I'm a, I'm a better killer. So it just doesn't work. The, Sustainability itself is not good enough either because to make something sustainable means keeping it in balance. But we are not in balance, we're off balance. Yeah. So you have to start to think restorative, reparative, regenerative. And this is what we call net positive. How companies thrive by, uh, and profit, if you want to, by solving the world's problems, not creating them. And if yeah. we can get there and get the governments uh, aligned to that, which currently actually pull in the wrong direction, but if we can get there, uh, I think we'll make a great uh, progress. And ultimately, it boils down to leadership because uh, this, is, this is actually not a crisis of poverty or inequality or climate change. Uh, this, in essence, is a crisis of apathy, of greed, of selfishness. And if we don't get to that human level to solve that, we will never get there. So Thank you. either we want to live as humanity or we get into the statistics of the other 68% of the species we've already lost over the last five decades. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> it's so reassuring to know that you were in the guardian of this uh, and playing a, a leadership role in this. Uh, wish you the best in the COP uh, meeting and, and, and make sure both you and, uh, you know, b both of you squeeze Boris Johnson as much as possible when you're there, uh, if, the, if that is possible. Uh, okay, could we move on? Fartoum, you're, again, we're running, we're short of time, but you lead an NGO at a local community, and I just wonder what life would have been like during COVID with the restrictions of movement, access uh, to the camps, and other challenging factors uh, at a local level. Hi, yes. Um we run an organization in Somalia, and in Somalia we have a um, crisis, um, and we have a conflict for the war, and top of that, we have a corona. So it was very challenging. And the message we are getting around the world was, wash your hand, stay home, be safe. And all of that, it was very challenging to do in Somalia. So if you say I'm staying home, it was no option to stay home. Most of the Somali people, it's like they have to go to find a job to put the meal in that day. Washing hands is like getting a water to wash your hands all the time. It wasn't easy either. So how can you um, send that message to the people and say, 
do those things because that's what we're hearing all the time. Wash your hands, wash your hands, stay home, be safe. One family is eight people and they have a one house or maybe one room. How can they have a distance? Um, it's, it's a very challenge. But we have to make a final way to do that. And also international community and everyone left because um, they didn't want to be stuck in Somalia. So we have, we have to come up something as a community to do the message and also to support the, our community. And then what we did was that our centers, Elm and Bees, we do the, we were starting to do the mask and sanitation. And we have a center for the vocational training. So our, our the students, they were doing the, and they built the plumbing team. They were building the IDB camps to have a stage they can wash the people with their hands. So it wasn't that much, but it was as much as we can. Also, we noticed the women, they were really, really resilient, and they were trying to help. They never left. They were there to support each other, to do as much as they can. But the situation was making really hard, and still we have that situation. And on top of that, the vaccination, it wasn't easy to get it. Because um, we were thinking developed countries are having more um, vaccinated. So if we got something, it was a small. So people thinking like the higher, that's the people who's getting it. But what if everyone else who doesn't have that? So it was a lot of challenge. And coming to the women, now we are forcing women to be part of the politician to have um, decision making part of it because as a Somali woman it's very difficult they always tell you stay home you're a woman, you stay home, don't go outside don't do this but when it comes to the crisis, they're there the one who's doing it stay in the hospital, stay in the places cooking food to the other families so this is where we're pushing now to see we noticed women how strong they are and thank, thank you. you thank you very much Fartoum thank you So we had a, an amazing discussion on the impact of COVID-19, and I'm very grateful for all the contributions that you've all made. And we're going to move on to, if you like, the next session, be a bit more, as Paul said, a bit more optimistic. Uh, and, and the optimism comes on the back of, if you look at history of crises, after every crisis, the world has been the most creative and the most innovative. If you just remember the last war, and COVID will not be different. And so we're moving into this new area of discussion, which is, you know, how do we build a sustainable preparedness for health security and resilience? And when you talk about innovation, you know, it's a great privilege to have one of our founders, Nubara Fayan, who is really been in the core of innovation and transformation, and its impact globally is well recognized by all of us in this room. And I'm gonna ask Nubar to set the scene, and then we follow up with Bernard to bring in his own thoughts about what does that mean in terms of globally, and also Armand later on in terms of, you know, where does industry fits in other industries so, Nubar, you are creative, you're imaginative, you always think about the future, uh, and I, your motto, which I'm getting to learn, what if? So tell us, what if of the future? Okay, well, I stand as accused, so. <laughs> um, so, um, well, Delhi already laid down the gauntlet by calling me an expert. Um, very little disturbs me more than that. Uh, it turns out um, I, I consider myself an amateur expert, uh, which is a kind of a wannabe expert. Uh, and so my comments should be taken like that. I'm by no means an expert in healthcare or policy or much of what I'm going to say, which is exactly how I prefer it. So, so as an expert, I would say you should take what I say with a grain of salt, which just makes the one point just to complement what you were saying, Delhi, which is if you don't know much about a topic, you should listen to people who know something about a topic. 
if you do know something about a topic, you should be careful that the people who know something about a topic don't become dogmatic and tell you what right and wrong is, because often they have an agenda. And we've also seen that play out in the pandemic gloriously. People have said lots of things that at the end of the day turn out not to be true. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask, get vaccines, get them once, get them twice. And they were all experts debating these things. And the reality is, you know, Richard Feynman, has a, you know, the, the, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, has a great statement, which is that science is the belief of, in the ignorance of experts. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Why? If experts knew everything, then there'd be nothing to do science on. That be it. No more knowledge to gain. And there's always more knowledge to gain. So I just say that just to set the mood, if you will, which is, yes, experts, but also let's think about what if. And that's what Ara was inviting me to talk about, which is what if things were different. Um, so, so I guess the, even before the pandemic, and I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with Ara on this as well, given his background in this area, um, is to say, okay, so why are we so unprepared for pandemics? For that matter, why are we unable to de deal with many pandemics? You know, we think that COVID-19 is the only pandemic we have. But by the definition of pandemic, obesity is a pandemic, I have it. Cardiovascular disease is a pandemic, cancer is a pandemic, Alzheimer's, what does that mean? That means it afflicts the globe, tons of people die, it has somewhat common origins, and we're not doing anything about it. It just kind of fits the description of, of pandemics. Slow pandemics that are chronic, fast pandemics that are infectious. So I would argue that this is more than just about infection and vulnerability, this is about healthcare. So we started thinking within our group of companies, uh, which generally develops new technologies for new drugs and new vaccines and new diagnostics, you know, why do we only work on these weapons? And you might say, what does that have to do, you know, a weapon, don't think of a drug as a weapon. Well, th here's the point. What we call healthcare, this is the what if, what we call healthcare, I would contend to you is actually sick care. And we started talking about this three years ago, and, and the more you look, the more you realize, I think that the evidence is clear. How do you know it's sick care and not healthcare? The answer is you have to get sick to get any of it. You don't get it when you're healthy, you only get it when you're sick. In fact, if you go in and they say you're healthy, they send you home. So it's sick care that we have. In the UK where they study these numbers closely, Roughly 97% of the dollars or pounds go to providing for the sick, not providing for the healthy. So, so the question becomes, what if we were spending 10% of our money actually providing now health care? And what might that look like? So before I answer that, let me just ask you to think of something else. What is this similar to? And I'd call this our physical security. Think about that. We have police, we have laws, we have the judicial system that enforces the laws, we have counterterrorism, intelligence, invasion of our privacy, all in the name of physical security. And we have armies and navies and all in the name of physical security. We are born with competent governments with the right to demand physical security. And what about our health? We have no health security. We're basically told, look, we're all gonna get sick and die, Stay as healthy as you can, eat well, exercise, etc. And when it doesn't work, we'll spend endless amounts of money, especially in the West, trying to do something about it, even though in most cases there's not much we can do about it. I don't want to offend anybody in the room, but to a first approximation, this is the trap we're in. And so we end up going after diseases, preferably when they're really late stage. Just think about it. Our best medications are in late stage diseases, not early stage. And why is that? As a developer of drugs, I'll tell you why it is. It's really easier to show in a small trial that's affordable that your medication works if the disease is serious. If the disease is not very serious, you have to do gigantic trials in order to show a slight difference, right? Because you can't save somebody if they're not about to die. But in cancer, they're about to die. You give them another month, you charge $100,000 per treatment. Just think about it. It's a perverse incentive to work on late-stage disease. Now, what's the problem with late-stage disease? Right? You might say, well, why isn't that the most compassionate thing to do? Somebody's dying, we throw all the resources. The answer is, just I'm not talking now as a scientist, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm a scientist. The problem is, by the time you have late-stage disease, your whole system is failing. It's not about one tiny protein in one type of cell in your liver that is, no, no, no. Every, your whole body has reacted for years and years, and it's lost. I mean, your car barely works. 
And now you're supposed to go in with one screwdriver and change something and then suddenly just won't work. So the hardest place to develop drugs for is late stage disease. The easiest place to show that it works is late stage disease. Hence, the trillions of dollars we're spending on healthcare, in my view. So the what if is, what if we actually said, maybe we should work upstream of disease. Now, the little we knew about molecular biology all these years didn't tell us what is, what is upstream of disease. We all like to believe that if you don't have a disease, you're well. Well, it turns out that if, you're, if you have hypertension, there were periods of time in your life where you had pre-hypertension. That is, the molecular basis of the hypertension was already there. It was advancing. The medical profession couldn't detect it. But surely, eventually, you got it. You also have pre-diabetes. We also have pre-cancer. We know this in colon cancer because we can detect polyps. That's just a pre-cancer. It's not a cancer medically, but we still decide we're going to intervene. So the question we would just throw out, not to go on too, for too long, is what if we as a society demanded health security from our governments, said, no, no, you're not well just because you're not sick. I want the, the technologies to tell me what I'm vulnerable to, not only by birth, but by the way I'm living, etc. What if the society said, you know, I want to take some of the money and try to, try to do something about it before it's a disease. I'll say one other thing. Those of us who live in the States, Paul, maybe you'll agree, we, you cannot turn on television or social media and not get ads for drugs. And, and they glorify it. It's like buying a car. So, you know, I jokingly, sadly, cynically, sometimes say, sometimes I see these ads for psoriasis drugs, and I kind of say, boy, I wish I had psoriasis, because they glorify this patient journey. Well, guess what? Given the choice... I'd rather be on a pre-patient journey. I don't want to be on a patient journey. Well, who gives you the ability to stay on a long pre-patient journey? The answer is nobody. Now, the interesting example we have, though, in our society is a vaccine. And we're just now seeing what it's like to be on a pre-patient journey as opposed to on a patient journey. But vaccines two years ago were the worst part of the pharmaceutical industry. People couldn't leave it fast enough. Nobody made any money on it. It was this slow 20-year, 10-year development awful part of the industry. So my, our message would be in the pandemic, post-pandemic learning period, if we could make room for this notion of how do you preempt disease? How do you delay disease? Some of you in the room, by the way, who are public health experts will say, all you're talking about is public health. Let me just differentiate this from public health. In my view, the public health community has gone to the other extreme, which is to say we need solutions that we can give to everybody for free to avoid something. Well, if I have prediabetes, you don't need to give the treatment for me to everybody. You just have to give it to the people who have prediabetes. And that becomes medicine. But if there's no disease, it's not medicine. And that becomes nothing. So we need to create as a society, by the way, Paul, Mary, others who are dealing at the global level, we need to collaborate to figure out how does somebody create a new segment of healthcare that's neither about wellness nor about disease. How do we shift resources? How do we get governments to allow for the regulation, to allow treatment of such pre-diseases? Right now, it's illegal. You cannot. You can give people supplements, because mostly they don't work. If you said they work, then you have to do clinical trials. Now it's a drug. It's really, really a messed up system. And the last thing I'll say is, as a result, our healthcare costs are exorbitant. And the inequities, let alone access in the rest of the world, all have to do with affordability. Well, if I'm only going to have late-stage treatments, they're going to be $100,000 to pay for the R&D. They're not going to be available to 99% of the world. Upstream, the costs don't have to be as high because the interventions don't have to be as much dealing with complexity and so forth. So I think ultimately, if we're going to deal with the cost of health, and by the way, I haven't even touched mental health. Ruben pointed out to me during the today that it's an interesting day. This is Mental Health Day. That's be this, this Sunday today. And we have everything I just said applies to mental health equally. We don't consider that a physical issue. It is. It is a, a physiological issue, if not a physical issue. And so take everything I said and add mental health security. How are we giving people mental health security? We're not. We just wait for a problem to emerge and we go, that's too complicated to deal with it. And surely one pill won't. It's just not true. So that's the what if. Sorry for going on and on. Thank you, Nubar. That's a, you know, 
that is what I call innovative leadership uh, in, a, in an area which could be transformational. Uh, with one caveat, we need to make sure it doesn't increase the inequalities that exist across the globe. But on the other hand, a lower and middle income country who doesn't have a health healthcare system, actual fact, this might be the innovative entry into those markets. So, Bernard, you're a physician. You've been health minister on three occasions. I just wonder what you think of this whole, it's not a philosophy, by the way. I know, Nuba mentioned that I've had the privilege of getting to know this whole program. This is real. Uh, there are people, including flagship, investing in this. And I just wanted to see if you were a health minister today, how would you react? D'abord, il y a eu des réclamations et des, et des plaintes et des explosions de passion qui étaient bien légitimes, bien légitimes. C'est un peu difficile de répondre à toutes ces passions. I'm sorry, but we have had a small technical glitch. Now the translation is resuming. So together with Paul Farmer, we have tried to pass a message to the whole medical world and the creation of Doctors Without Borders as well as other partners has uh, brought us back to what we claimed 50 years ago uh, regarding prevention. Well, this is not easy, of course, because we know that the whole system is focused on therapy, the therapy to take care of the disease. I mean, this is important, of course, but as we have just heard, to turn around the situation and really talk about public health. I mean, what is public health? It didn't even used to be a university course or a field of interest in the past. There was no talk of public health. Uh, we used to talk only about therapy, cure, because of the legitimate machinery of research and development, drugs, and so on and so forth. And all this was part of the public health medicine. But it wasn't all positive, of course, because in the old system, we had research and then we had therapeutic practices that had to take care of a high number of diseases. We're not going to throw everything out, of course. But we must continue to go on taking care of diseases on one hand. But if we think that public health uh, can become something more ubiquitarian, well, that is fine. But it, fine, it is exactly the contrary of what is happening today. And then we've got poverty. Uh, we've got economic differences. And we have never focused on the disease of other communities. We used to focus only on our diseases. But in the past, perhaps we should have invented a system where it was normal that the different clinical trials considered also their diseases, also the other diseases, those in the developing countries, in the countries where there is less public health and less hygiene. And I believe that this is still the situation today. I mean, this is not part of our daily practices, neither at medical nor at political level. And this is also a highly political problem. And I'm looking at Paul um, because we should have remembered or acknowledged from the very beginning that medicine is also political. And you are telling us what we have tried to disseminate for a long time with the creation of Doctors Without Borders, with the Nobel Peace Prizes. I mean, we wanted them all to focus on medicine as a policy to have a better life worldwide. This is incredibly difficult. You are absolutely right. But I mean, let's try and move on little by little. I mean, politics have taught me that you shouldn't hope for the impossible, but you have to progress step after step so that we can focus on the many problems you have raised. Mary said something really stimulating. We still have to do at every level so many things uh, with the individuals, with the public sector. I mean, I apologize if I have to talk on the pandemic again, but I believe that this is an extraordinary 
opportunity. Obviously, it is not just a positive thing, but COVID has allowed us all to make a diagnosis of inequality. Inequality kills. It kills the poor rather than the rich. But a lot of progress has been made in recent times. Uh, fewer and fewer people die of cancer. You know, we used to die of tumor more than dying of COVID in the past. Uh, in the future, there will be other viruses. We will have to develop new vaccines, viruses that are unknown to us right now. So the present research machinery is not sufficient. It needs funds, and it must be worldwide. For instance, in the European Union, which is still a wonderful project, did not even have the idea of health care, of European health care. Why? Because it was a matter of pharmaceutical companies. But now the European Union focuses on health care. So think about the differences between the rich and the poor countries. I mean, how are we going to offer to the poor countries vaccines and the intelligent use of them, because this is part of a medical practice which should not be taken for granted. And here we need a political action, not only a technical one. I mean, the technology is there, but healthcare cannot be restricted to vaccinating the people in the rich countries. This won't give results. Vaccination is right now the only weapon against COVID. So it must be managed as a political asset as well. In France, we have participated in the history of vaccines. Think about Mr. Pasteur. The UK have given their contribution too, of course. So every Saturday in France, there are dozens of thousands of people protesting to oppose vaccination. They have a specific disease, stupidity. And dear friends, some tend to believe that this is a protest for freedom. But freedom from what? From the virus? I mean, politics is rediscussed and questioned every time. And the French Novax people they complain politically. It is the extreme right and the extreme left. I mean, if you want to talk about public health, then the Novax people say, no, it is a matter of my own individual freedom. You have no right to oblige me to do something. I mean, Public health is really difficult to consider as a universal action. And then, for the first time, with this pandemic, in less than one year, a vaccine has been finalized. This has happened for the first time with this timing. It used to take years. The antiviral vaccine has been found in record time. And luckily, most of the people worldwide have understood that it was necessary to submit to vaccination. I'm saying the majority, not all of them. The poor countries have understood that, but they have no vaccines. And that epitomizes inequality through charity, humanitarian aid, through uh, the effort of humanitarians, we will try to provide them with more vaccines. Paul, I can also recall what we did for AIDS. At a given point, patents had to be questioned, and we need to go on doing that. But at the same time, we need to feed research. It is complicated, but we need to provide another dimension to this, the general and the world dimension. What we have lost so far, as shown by COVID, well, I'm sitting close to you, but I'm close to all the other people as well, because everybody has recalled this, i.e. COVID has exacerbated this equality. I mean, 
We have said what we could have done prior to the pandemic, but we did not do. So in the end, we will we make it, considering what Paul told us regarding the worldwide economy and the need of public and private funds and investments. I mean, will we succeed in having a world direction? Okay, we've heard some criticism about the UN. This is true, but is there only UN? The only international organization that is relatively efficient is the UN. I mean, we cannot create on a private level a second UN. We know that this is not enough, but we need to make use of it. So it should be our target that of creating more equality, a complete equality regarding the distribution of vaccines to poor countries, which has been impossible so far. Distribution to developing countries. Because if we do not do that, we shan't have a world public health. And I'm not only talking to doctors here, I'm talking to politicians as well. This is a political issue. Have the UN debated COVID? No, they haven't. I mean, sometimes somebody hints to the problem, but they haven't done anything at the Security Board of the UN, Security Council of the UN. And this is actually their task. So if world health is not the business, of the Security Council of the UN, well, which way are we going? I mean, we have seen some tangible progress, but this is not enough. There are many risk elements, and we must focus on all of them. You know, we have to come to terms with this. We've got one life, and we're all mortal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you. <laughs> Bernard, I love your passion. It's real, true French passion there. Uh, I, I presume you're not standing again uh, after a few of the comments you made, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to see you in action. Nuba. Yeah, well, I, it was great, great listening to, to kind of a master class of of human kind of health policy, governments, and equality, just great. You know, I thought since we're gathered here, it's kind of an auspicious place, and the comment is made about inequality and the like. I mean, and there's lots of different opinions here. I'll offer my opinion, Bernard. I think that the solution to providing vaccines to every single person on the planet is imminently achievable. Imminently achievable. There's simply no body that can, no body, international body, that can actually cause the resources to be deployed to do that. So countries are making pronouncements, but they're doing nothing with the resources needed to do it. So the notion that it's going to happen based on philanthropy, good nature, etc., there's no way this is going to happen without governments leading this process, the, the richer countries leading this process. And I can tell you, because I know the math very simply, the capacity will exist in 2022 to vaccinate everybody on the planet. There's no way to stop that capacity because the money has already been spent by the companies, including my company, to produce it. We will produce 3 billion doses. Pfizer will produce 4 billion doses. That doesn't count AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, the Chinese and the Russians. Whatever people think about which vaccine they prefer, there will be enough doses. Second, the cost of these doses compared to the impact on healthcare is maybe a 100 to 1 payback. Not 5 to 1, 3 to 1, 100 to 1. We're hearing about drugs. We talked about medications. People are now offering drugs if you get sick for $2,000 per person. The vaccine is $10, $15 a person. And yet, people in the governments are saying, yeah, at three we can do it, but at five we can't do it. Simply not true. Simply not true. So I will say as one participant, because we've, as a company, not to be defensive, but invested, forward invested billions of dollars to prepare and produce the output. The governments are playing politics, as you said. It's all politics. Maybe they're playing medicine. I don't know. But they're playing politics because they are manipulating the very same media that Dele talked about to put out confusion. 
because they are attacking doctors for not doing their job, distribution for not doing their job, the global health delivery system for not being ready, they don't have enough freezers, they don't have... Everything to distract the discussion from the fact that it will take political will globally to do this. And guess what? Nobody is going to win an election for having stepped up and said, let's vaccinate the world. That's why it's not happening. We don't elect the leaders of the United States based on what they do in uh, uh, Burundi. We don't. We elect them because of what they do in the United States. So this notion of, oh my God, there's nationalism, I don't understand. The voting is nationalistic. And so, so I'm just sitting here as a private citizen, but now caught in the moment of having a significant amount of the counter-terrorist weapon, which is a vaccine, basically. It's the best mask. Turns out if you can wear a mask inside, you don't wear a, need to wear a mask inside. We can produce it, it at high quality and deliver it, and they know that. Question is, who, and if we can figure that out, we can also figure out climate change. I actually think that the entire climate change community should say we have to solve the vaccine thing as a prelude, not just as an experience, of how governments are willing to spend money on something that does not benefit them. So that's, that's the two cents I'd say. So I agree, but I don't think it's a confusing issue. It's a political decision that we cannot take because of the way our elections are working. Nobody cares. Thank you, Nubar. Mary wants to come in briefly. Yeah, then I, I just want to come in briefly to reference the recent um, pandemic preparedness report of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and uh, um, Helen Clark and Ernesto Zidio and a lot of other experts. That addressed um, the political dimensions of, of pandemic preparedness and called for a, um, uh, a um, health security high-level body at head of state level, asked for um, a General Assembly resolution during the recent UNGA and then said also um, further strengthen the World Health Organization. Guru Brundtland um, thinks this is the best solution um, uh, and the elders are promoting it. We, we missed the boat at the UNGA. Um, the, the World Health Assembly, when it was discussed last May, said they postponed their discussion for six months yeah. with no thing. Um, so there is a lack of political will, but there isn't a lack of um, you know, a, a, a report very well thought out of how to go forward. And I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Mary. Nubar, we'll come back to you in terms of preparedness, in terms of the vaccines in the future at some stage, but I'd like to go to Arman now to really get your views about you know, the supply chain and the technology that we all struggled, if you remember the pictures from this country where we're sitting in, Italy, in February of last year with the lack of ventilators, you can just imagine what was happening in lower and middle income countries. So I really appreciate your views in terms of the basic supplies. Yeah. Thank you, Ara. Uh, the access to health technologies uh, and products in, it has been a huge issue even before the pandemic. Yeah? And talking about low and middle income countries, um, yeah, let's take as an example Africa, which represents uh, uh, roughly 18, 19 percent of global population. But if we look now to medical devices and technologies, uh, uh, Africa represents only 1.3 percent. Yeah, huge uh, issue with the access to uh, modern technologies and devices. And uh, the COVID pandemic uh, make the situation even worse. I, again, one example hospital ventilators, which are critical for the survival of uh, COVID patients. Af in Africa, at global basis, Africa got roughly 0.4% of global ventilators. It's, it's kind of a disaster, yeah? Again, I try to be very brief here, but uh, based on uh, the experience uh, from the last 18, 20 months, and talking about what industry can do um, to address this uh, inequality issue and provide better access to uh, quality products and uh, technologies, I would use the concept of uh, duty of care. And there are three main topics I would like to mention. First is um, 
that an access to product and um, technology should become a key business imperative. I completely agree with Paul's statement uh, that this is also a leadership issue. Yeah, Business performance should be measured against this KPI in addition to many other KPIs every, each and every company has in the dashboard. Second, um, again, industry and each uh, and every company should ensure business sustainability and prepare for the next crisis by critically assessing uh, its capabilities and go-to-market approach, mainly in uh, portfolio, supply chain, and distribution. You know, you can uh, get many times the uh, point that in emerging markets or in low-middle income countries, the financial um, limitation is the main one. It, while it is true to some extent, I have many examples when actually end uh, user price in low and middle income countries is higher than in a uh, developed world. Why? Because you have inefficient supply chain model, inefficient distribution with three, four, five intermediaries and the price is going up to the roof uh, uh, and that's, that's an issue. So companies can do a lot of things to uh, critically assessing their supply chain and go-to-market model. And the last and probably the most important point uh, is, uh, is actually uh, companies should think and reassess their business model and establish more effective partnerships with the government, with the NGOs and uh, um, other organizations because otherwise you will not be able to really address this inequality issue at a global level. A small example, now we are trying to um, start in Armenia the initiative to accelerate the transformation of the healthcare by creating this network. And based on the public-private partnership, we believe it can engage more effectively different players on the public side, industry, and academia. Thank you. Thank you, Arma. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's a critical point which needs to be also needs a political leadership, as you correctly pointed out. Guys, we've had an amazing uh, debate today. So we're going to move on to some questions on the, on the audience who've been very patiently sitting and listening to us. So there's a one hand up there. Please. This room at this moment is holding probably the best intelligence of healthcare and, and um, NGOs and so on. Can, after this conference, can there not be, especially Nubar, you with the voice to the world at this moment, especially given COVID, can we not make some kind of challenge or directive to the UN, to, to the world, to leaders and say, you know, we challenge you, and I don't know if someone here can obviously do a write-up about some of the things, that might be you. <laughs> You can sing it to them, okay? And, uh, um, but uh, something has to come out of this that makes an impact. Yes, just exactly what Nubar said. We know that the world can be entirely vaccinated, but whatever it is, I think there has to be a statement that comes out to the world from this incredible wealth of um, information and experts, to use the word experts. So. I think that's thank my, you. Mike's thank you, thank you. I definitely we will be writing this up. I mean, the analogy that comes to me is the last war. You know, a group of leaders came around in one room, and they called the last war as a never again moment. And we haven't seen a war. We haven't seen a world war since that day. Something happened there to prevent this, and I don't see why the legacy of COVID would not be. Let's support the science. Let's change behaviors of our citizens when it comes to vaccines, liberty versus self-protection. Absolutely. David. A number of, of people commented uh, during their excellent presentations about the role of the news media uh, as impeding a solution to this problem of the pandemic and the dissemination of false information. Uh, and I agree that this is a very serious problem. I just want to share with this audience that uh, newspapers in the United States and in many countries 
are subject to legal action if they recklessly print false information. Uh, were taken to court, and those legal actions can be very punishing, and they have significant effect. So one simple uh, challenge is to extend the rules that exist now for newspapers to the other publishing platforms, Facebook most obviously, that disseminate information but are not now subject to the same kinds of legal challenge. If you did that, it's not a complicated change. It re requires ch changing something called Section 230 of the Federal Communications Act. They would be responsible for every lie, every, every, every uh, thing that spreads uh, uh, f uh, information that keeps people from becoming more healthy, seeking, seeking health care. A second point I want to make, um, as lies about health care and everything else spread, the value of true information is going to increase. That's just a, that's just a fact. Uh, it may take a while. We, we may have such a polluted stream of information that we're all gagging and choking. But at some point, people will rebel. They'll, it'll start with people who are financial traders who can't uh, buy and sell securities on the basis of information that may be true, may be false, they don't know. So they'll start paying for true information. So over an arc of time, uh, maybe my uh, career lifetime, maybe not, I think we can expect that there'll be a return of more reliable sources of information because people will demand them. You can't live in a polluted uh, information uh, eco ecosystem forever any more than you can live in a in a city where you're choking to death. Uh, those two thoughts. Thank you very much, David. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think if it's a simple uh, change in the legislation, I think that will be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, and uh, you just wish that they all have the standards of the Post or the BBC or whatever it happens to be. So grateful for your input. We probably should put this as one of our recommendations too. Any other hands up? Yes, sir and then the lady beside him. My name's uh, Vahe Vartanyan, I'm from, from London. Um, I was going to reiterate a lot of the points about, about the, the government situation, but we won't get into that. What I thought I could provide as a positive perspective with regards to private capital. Um, so I run an organization uh, called the Global Family Office Community, which is a, a community of, of wealthy families who who we, we get together. Um, and uh, over the past two years or so, we've definitely seen an acceleration of trends in the focus on them wanting to do good in the world uh, with regards to uh, social impact, sustainability. So we're seeing a lot of capital now being deployed uh, directly or, or indirectly in, into, into these areas, which I think is a real positive development, so that's healthcare, health technology, um, climate change, clean energy, uh, and so on. Um, so I think uh, the challenge is how can we do more and bring all these people together, and, and all these families want to do good. Um, the, the United Nations sent us a document where, where they showed us a snapshot of, of projects which they were working on, two from each country, um, and, and Armenia wasn't even on there, which I got offended actually, being, being an Armenian. I was like, how can you send me a document without Armenia being, being on there? It may, um, be, it may be true. <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, uh, and I said, well, uh, well, okay, these are the things that you're working on, but all these families are also working on their own projects. They've all got their own foundations. They're, they're all doing great work in, in lots of different countries. How can you help them? Uh, and there was no answer to that, to that question. I'm still waiting for, yeah. for a reply to that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Good to hear on the investments uh, into... So, Leila. Yes, yeah. following uh, you know, the community, I'm just, uh, I want to address the situation of human rights defenders, especially women human rights defenders. You know, during this uh, corona and COVID, uh, you know, the situation 
actually become worse. And the right to, you know, advocating for, for the right to health become one ground, ground for prosecution of human rights defenders. So I think that's a really important issue. When you are writing up to authorities, politicians, please bear in this in mind that people on the ground, human rights defenders, the, those who are advocating for the right, for the access to vaccine, right to health, they've been being prosecuted or put in jail in many countries. So I think it's also important to focus on the role of those who are advocating for access to vaccine and healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Another good policy decision. Our winner, Julianne. I would like to add something to what we have heard. When the pandemic started, there was fear. So the population was really afraid because we received messages. We saw on TV that thousands of people were dying. Actually, women live on informal economy. And once restricted in their movement, they used up all their capital. And now they have absolutely nothing. They do not have what is necessary to go on living. And then, of course, domestic violence against women, against children. This has become much worse with COVID. And the lack of good, valuable information. I mean, there are vaccines that have a long duration, that are on the market, but there has been an acceleration. Uh, there has been an improvement in technology, and we were able to get vaccines very, very quickly. New vaccines were produced in a much shorter period of time, but the people have not been informed of the fact that, that thanks to technology, vaccines have been developed fast. And people not knowing this have trusted negative messages on the social media that have created a lot of confusion. You have mentioned the United Nations. Yes, we've got the UN, but I believe that we should define an intermediary between the United Nations and us working on the field. Mary Robinson was recalling what I told her when she started the platform for women. I said, it's a wonderful idea, but we have to start from the bottom. We have to see how the women of the communities can be connected with you women up there. And this connection must be built. We need a connection from the local communities and the people in the agencies. So how can we eliminate this distance, this lack of communication? I've just learned that there are families wanting to help. But do local people know about this? Of course not. We do not have this kind of information. We need a strategy, an information strategy, so that everybody can know about the possibilities. The United Nations ordered their staff to protect themselves, to close their doors. Well, all agencies blocked any contact because they were afraid of contagion. So who could help the people in conflict areas? Who could help the people exposed to disease and famine? And famine? Women did that. Women got up and tried to put together the few goods that could be distributed in the refugee camps. Women have nothing to use when they have menstruation. So they had to find a way to provide women's towels for women for their menstruation. So we quickly took measures. We appealed to some foundations. We asked for emergency funding to provide soap, masks, gel, and food. There are refugee camps where people said, no, no food, please. We need water. We got no water. At least we should have water. You know, you have to 
find a way to approach local communities and to listen to them, because the local communities can tell you what they actually need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. I think one last comment from uh, Ruben, our <coughs> co-founder. Yeah, if I may just, I mean, I was listening very <coughs> carefully about what was talking. There was one question which was coming to my mind again and again about uh, who will finally make this final decision? Because we're talking about numbers, we're talking about all these problems and everybody's agreeing. We're sitting here, the former president, the former head of CEO, the biggest corporation, the member of the Lord, member of the, the, the pilot Lord, and we are raising, I think, the point about who in the finally, we expect that we understand what the new bar is raising. Where is the power of decision making today? Because the state, and you said correctly, is national elected and have a five terms or four, four years horizon, very populistic, and they cannot do many things. And my point was, okay, we talk about these all problems, people are smart, intelligent, successful, and understand these all issues. And we're facing the challenge, how to make decision. Where is decision-making process broken today? And how the community, by the way, I 100% agree with you, is the institutions need to make decision, and we believe institutions can make this decision, because we meant that is not allowed them to make this decision, and they are not being selected, the people who can make this decision, in my view. And at the same time, communities who will be this building now, are becoming more and more polarized and more extreme, anti, but not about how to make involvement and cooperation with the institution to make the decision together. In my view, it's one of the biggest challenges about, not about only putting the right diagnosis, which is key, but how to make this decision process different, in my view, the biggest challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. I couldn't agree more with you. The sad fact is, you know, we don't have the political leadership that thinks into the future. Politics is about short-termism. Um, politics doesn't see through the borders despite COVID, uh, with one exception, which is what happened after the war and the creation of a, you know, Northern European alliance, which really stopped the wars. And we need to think that way. And uh, that's the, that's, yes, yes. And, uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, hopefully, yeah, I think there's been enough human sacrifices. Yes, Lima, and that, yeah. I, I just want to, I'm, I'm sad. Briefly, because we really need to close down, yeah. I'm yeah. sad and listen to everyone speak, and I'm looking at the Aurora thing of awakening humanity, and I think it all boils down to that. Yeah. How do we awaken the humanity, each and every one of us here? We yeah. may not be able to give health security, we may not be able to give preventive peace building. We may not be able to get the Fortune 500 companies to do what they need to do. Governments may be trying to be political about the lives of people. Yeah. But the one point that keeps coming back to mind is what can each and every one of us do through our actions to awaken humanity in our communities, at our workplace, and then we'll probably in our lifetime, or maybe not, see the ripple effect, and that is the joy of the aurora. Thank you. I think you've given us the title of the document we're going to write, Awakening Humanity. Uh, Ruby, did you want a question? Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, quiero expresar mi preocupación con respecto... I would like to express my worry, my concern, uh, with regard to, to the media. There is a a particular situation that characterizes the world, especially uh, the regions of conflict. There are situations where, uh, that are worse than, uh, um, than weapons or bullets, and I'm referring to uh, microphones, the microphones of the media. Uh, sometimes uh, the news uh, are just uh, used to make uh, hatred prol proliferate and in those places where there is uh, an interest by uh, the people who are financing uh, the war itself. And the victims that cannot use the, the media to uh, report what is going on. And I would like to include this problem, this uh, important issue, 
in the international objectives uh, that we have to pursue because uh, the, the services that uh, the media are supplying have uh, to, uh, to be improved from this point of view. And with the reference to the situation of the local community uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19, in my country, we have uh, uh, recently emerged from a uh, uh, very uh, harsh war. And because of the COVID, many families had to go back to uh, their homes, uh, to uh, rural areas that had already been hit by the economic crisis. This means uh, that uh, uh, they become victims once again. There are families that go without food, that have uh, no livelihoods. Sometimes just one family member has uh, wages at all. Then uh, there is a uh, family abuse. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, armed groups at local level. And uh, as always, women are those who suffer more, most of all. And unfortunately, there are no opportunities for these local communities. It would be uh, interesting to uh, focus attention on them. Thank you very much for that last comment uh, and what's happening in Colombia. So on that note, could I just take a moment to thank our distinguished panel here and the amazing contributions you gave, the diversity of the contributions, and, uh, and also from the audience, uh, some of the suggestions, including those of David and a number of others. So I'm very, very grateful for that. I'll speak to the founders about writing this up somehow and getting it out. And uh, I think there's a lot of rich material here. Uh, I did start with a doom, but I'm grateful to Nubar to give us the hope uh, and the potential of science in the future. Never underestimate the role of science, and uh, and I love his quotation: "Science is there because of the what is it? The inaccuracies of an expert, is it? Ignorance of an expert." So, on that note, uh, I think this is the end of the session. Uh, I will ask. Uh, uh, if, if you want me to close on the behalf of the founders, just to thank them as members of the selection committee and also the audience. Thank you, Nubar. Thank you, Ruben, thank you. for an amazing... Uh, uh, and, and also to say, behind, behind all great men, there is a secretariat that makes this happen. And I really wanted to make sure that you all thank them for all the hard work they put into it. I hope you get some lunch or something and wish you a safe travels home. Thank you.